<laughs> oh, these are these are switched up. So I forgot to switch the RMS. But other than that, all right. I'm actually going to flip the order of these first two um, problems from the slides. So. Reminder, how do we know if something is a meso compound? It has like an axis of symmetry. Yeah, an internal mirror plane. So out of these three, do any of them have that? See, I'd say it's one that's the most questionable. I would I would go with B. I think A and B. I think A and B, and it helps sometimes to redraw them, not as the the three D model. So if we look at A, so we're talking two D mirrors. Well, if, if we redraw it in two D with the wedges and dashes to show the three D part, it becomes more obvious which ones sure. have that mirror plane. Because this is the cyclopentane with two uh, OH groups sticking upward. If we draw it as a flat. Flat uh, pentagon. That makes it a lot easier to see. That definitely has a line of symmetry in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. And see, this one we can see pretty easily too. So it's pentane with two nitrogens sticking up towards us. So this one as well has an internal mirror plane, right? So these both are meso. If we, if we flip the symmetry on both of these, um, on both of the stereo centers, we're gonna get the same molecule back, right? Because we can take this, we wanted to make this look like both of these nitrogens going into the board. All we have to do is take it and flip it like a pancake. And same here, if we reflect both of these, we'll get both um, hydroxyl, both um, oxygens going into the board, which would be the same as if we just flipped the whole thing. If we flip one of the stereo centers, now it doesn't have an internal mirror plane. Now it's not a meso compound anymore. All right, how about B? Kind of looks like a mirror plane, but if we redraw it the way it's currently drawn, it's not explicitly shown, but the, we can assume that those are chlorines because they're green. But for the sake of answering this question, that doesn't really matter, right? So it doesn't have a mirror plane drawn this way. If we take this, if we rotate this so that the chlorine is pointed up like it is over here, we're going to get something that looks like, so I didn't touch anything over here. So I just, if I rotated it so that we can make the carbons look symmetrical, then we're going to wind up with Chlorine going back and the hydrogen coming out. So basically, we took these ones and rotated it 180 so that this line is now this way. Then that puts the chlorine into the board, not out of the board. So this one is not a meso compound. It has a meso stereoisomer, but this version of it is not meso. The meso version. So th there's this version, the mirror image of this, where the chlorines are flipped. One's into the this one's into the board, that one's out of the board, and then the meso version, where they're both in the board or both out of the board. So with that in mind, 
let's do the, the flip side of this. Is, okay, here's a molecule. Figure out how many stereocenters it has and figure out all the possible stereoisomers. So what's our key for figuring out if something is a stereo center? Four different constituents on the carbon. Exactly. Although as it's voting season, I'll also make the distinction. They're substituents, not constituents. But I knew what you meant. So out of this molecule, what's, where do we have our stereo centers? The center carbons. The center carbons. These ones aren't. Anything that's CH3 or CH2, by definition, is not going to be because those hydrogens are identical. But here and here, we have two stereocenters. So now that we've identified them, we can go back to doing it as the skeletal structure to save some space. So, the easiest way to do these is if we have two stereocenters, there's going to be at most four stereoisomers, right? And so the, the best way to think about these is to think about them in terms of basically like a binary option. They can be up or down. So I'm going to leave all the carbons in the plane of the board, and I'm just going to treat the oxygens as what I'm switching around between these. So we can have oxygen one up. Oxygen two up. We can have oxygen one up, oxygen two down. We can have oxygen one down, oxygen two up. Or we could have both of them down. Now, are all of these distinct stereoisomers? Which ones are not? The blue and the red are these. Oh, go up and. Yeah, exactly. So to get from the blue one to the red one, I would just have to take it and flip it like a pancake and we get to the other molecule. These ones, the green and the purple, you can't. The green one, if you flip it like a pancake, you get the same molecule back because that puts this oxygen down and this oxygen up when we flip it. And we flip it the same direction here, we get the same molecule back again, but still oxygen the first oxygen up and the second oxygen down. So you can think about it like a propeller in this case, or a, a fan blade or a screw for that matter. Projection, right? With the Newman projections, one way to look at it, yeah. Um, but, and really when you have these two stereo centers, 
like visually, it kind of looks like a propeller or a screw too, right? It's got right-handedness to it versus, or left-handedness to it, depending on what you're, uh, how you're defining it. Uh, if you rotate them the same direction, the oxygen wind up doing the same thing over and over again. And it's gonna be the same, but opposite to the other one, the mirror image. So basically what this question is asking you to do is be able to do the Punnett square version. Like, look, if you have two stereo centers, be able to come up with all the possible drawings and then cross out the ones or identify the ones that are meso along the way. Okay. All right. Questions on stereo chemistry? I think we've beaten that one to death a little bit. We should feel pretty good about those. The only one like random question would be all the meso compounds we've seen so far have an even number of chiral centers. You could have an odd number if one of them's in the mirror plane, right? If it's like in theory, yeah. Yeah. So you could have That's a meso compound with th th three stereo centers. In this case, the mirror plane, we could draw it through any of them, really. But your it's symmetrical with three stereo centers. The key aspect is that it's symmetrical, which means this one actually, one of them can be down and the other two up and still have that mirror plane, right? Because you'll still have have that line going right through that oxygen, regardless of if it's up or down. Um, trying to think. There's not a whole lot. That, so we, we usually look at them two at a time because when you start getting to larger molecules with more and more stereo centers, um, they tend to be very, very picky about their stereo centers and you wind up using common names for the different isomers. Um, for instance, glucose has five stereo centers, and they're all they all have to have the proper orientation for it to be glucose. If you flip one of them, it's not glucose anymore. So there's a lot of, of weirdness that way as well, um, where as soon as you get to these large, the, the more in the, important molecules that have more than two stereo centers tend to have common names that are specific to that orientation, that specific stereo isomer. So there's glucose. So four stereo centers. No, uh, one, two, yeah, one, four stereo centers. Five, but that one can switch back and forth um, when it does when it does a ring opening reaction and ring closing reaction. Glucose has an open chain form as well as a closed chain form. This is the closed chain form. When it opens that ring and becomes a close an open chain form, it can switch which stereo, but the stereo chemistry is right here on this one. The rest of them are locked in place. So if you switch any of these other four, it's not glucose anymore. And specifically, if you've ever heard the term dextrose to refer to glucose, dextrose means that it's the right-handed version on that carbon specifically. But as soon as you put it into water, you allow it to go through those ring opening and closing reactions and it's an equilibrium process. So as soon as you do that, you don't have pure dextrose anymore. You have a mixture of dextrose and the left-handed version, which I don't think actually has a name. Dextrose is the version that's produced in plants though. All right, we're going to do 
there's a lot of slides in this slide deck, but a lot of them are reviewed that we're going to go pretty quickly through to get to the stuff that's new and that's relevant to the test. Um, but I couldn't in good conscience just get rid of the full slide on the second law of thermodynamics or getting to what gives free energy is. All right, so we covered this a little bit on Thursday. For any spontaneous process, delta S the universe increases. And any reversible process means it's not spontaneous, it means it's at equilibrium. It's, if it's at equilibrium and something changes the equilibrium, like Le Chatelier's, that's a reversible process when it shifts back to equilibrium for the most part. And so anything that we can observe happening, though, is an irreversible process, is the, is the term that's used. It's not actually irreversible in the English meaning of the word, but in the mathematical physics definition, irreversible just means specifically delta S the universe increases. And so the other thing that we're gonna need to do here is realize that delta S of the universe is a big picture idea, right? But at the same time, we can break it down into system and surroundings. System is just whatever we're talking about in chemistry. That's usually a chemical reaction, but it can be a closed vessel. It just means we've got something that we're considering, not the surroundings. It's basically our system and everything else is the universe, which kind of makes sense. And that breaks it down, this big idea of delta S of the universe into a chunk that we can actually understand. It's basically, we don't care what else is happening. We're gonna look at this process, which is our system. Everything else will take care of itself. So it's still not super useful. We can measure delta S of a system, but how do we measure delta S of the surroundings? We basically say, okay, well, regardless of what other reactions might be happening in the surroundings, we can, we can calculate the change in entropy of the surroundings by looking at the change in temperature of the surroundings. If you increase the change in, or if you increase the temperature of the surroundings, we're gonna basically say that no other chemical reaction in the universe is happening. The only source of uh, change in entropy for the, all of the surroundings is just whatever energy flows from our system into the surroundings. So we can define delta S of the surroundings as in terms of heat. Q is our term for heat, right? Q is mass times specific heat times delta T. Um, and this just comes from some of the math behind the definition of entropy. We can say that the amount of energy that goes into a system divided by the temperature of that system is the change in entropy for the, for the surroundings. So, Q of the system is going to be negative, the system lost energy, then that means it went into the surroundings and increased the temperature of the surroundings, increased the molecular motion of the surroundings. All right, and if we're at a constant pressure, remember how I said that delta H had some weird isobaric, it had some, some definitions from, from multivariable Cal. Um, if you're at a constant pressure, you can say that Q of the system is equal to delta H of the system. If you're not at a constant pressure, then you get some weirdness happening. There has to be another term in there, but since we're usually undergoing a reaction, unless it's a closed system, like sealed from the atmosphere, most reactions are happening at a constant pressure, right? It's atmospheric pressure, whatever it happens to be for the day is we can consider that a constant pressure. So if we can define delta S of our surroundings in terms of the system, and we can define Q for the system as delta H of the system, we can do a quick substitution to get delta, to get delta S of the universe purely in terms of our system now. We basically remove that surroundings bit by redefining delta S of the surroundings in terms of the system, which is kind of like just a little bit of an algebraic sleight of hand, 
to put it all in terms of things we can actually measure that are dependent on our reaction and nothing else. But since we don't really like fractions when we can avoid them, we might as well get um, move that negative sign with it. Where did that negative sign come from? Because I think I actually had was missing it on one of the previous slides. Okay, okay. Delta S of the of the surroundings is negative Q of the system because Q whatever Q is um, when it leaves the system and goes to the surroundings, there's a negative sign in there. Right. Because what's gained by the surroundings was lost by the system. A negative difference would be right. increase. Exactly. So I think that this one I should have had a negative sign on there. And I'm just sloppy making the slides. And here, the, when it refers to an isothermal process on the previous slide, that's we're looking at both the system and the surroundings and like taking the average or is kind it, of. So there's heat gain in the system. Right. That's lost from the surroundings. It's just the net. And, and you're asking PCAM questions that I'm not prepared to answer. Uh, but basically, that's, that's part of the derivation. We have to make these assumptions that is isobaric for part of it and isothermal for part of it, even though it's not really isothermal. Um, we're, we're redefining it that way because it makes this derivation a lot easier if we don't have to use multivariable calculus. Um, we can do this without making that assumption, but it has a lot more terms to it and a lot more partial differentials. Um, and since this isn't a calculus class, we're just going to say, take me at my word and take more PCM if you want to know more about it. <laughs> um, so if we multiply both sides by negative T, we get negative T times delta S of the universe is equal to delta H of the system minus T delta S of the system, which should look familiar. So what is negative T delta S of the universe? It gives free energy. So this is our derivation, it gives free energy. Comes, it comes straight from the second law of thermodynamics and multivariable calculus of pressures and temperatures and heats. And that gives us delta G. So <laughs> if, delta, if delta S of the universe is positive, it's spontaneous, right? The delta S of the universe is positive, this whole term is negative because of that negative T. T has to be positive because we're in Kelvin. And that negative sign is always there. So as long as delta S of the universe is positive, delta G will be negative. So that's where we come from our, our uh, definition here. If delta G of the reaction is less than zero, the reaction is spontaneous. That's the key of those slides. Knowing where it comes from is interesting and knowing that you can, it's not just out of nowhere. But the bullet point here is this equation and this line here. And it's also just kind of cool to, be, to realize that delta G is really a way of estimating entropy of the universe. All right. So what does this mean as far as our our use of this reaction, we're not actually going to do much with the math here, other than I'll, I might give you delta H and delta S and ask you to predict if it's spontaneous at a certain temperature. The other way we can look at this is in terms of predicting whether a reaction is spontaneous, not just qualitatively, because there's a few possibilities. So for this reaction, you said if it's Negative and spontaneous. If delta G is negative, the reaction is spontaneous. So for this reaction, this is a reaction I've been studying yet. We will study it. It's called the Diels Alder reaction. And most of the named reactions wind up showing on standardized tests. If you take the chemistry GRE or might even show up on the MCAT in the OCHEM portion, they love to throw this reaction in there. So we'll study it in more detail later. For now, we can just think about it in terms of pi bonds and sigma bonds. We break a couple of pi bonds and make new sigma bonds. Pi bonds are less stable than sigma bonds. So this should be downhill in energy in terms of delta H, right? We made this molecule more stable by making more sigma bonds. 
So if delta H is negative, we would say that that, react, that piece favors spontaneity. It favors the reaction being spontaneous because delta H is negative. However, delta S for this reaction is negative as well. Because, because we start with two distinct molecules, we wait, make one molecule. That's less disorder than we had to begin with, right? And then if you throw that negative sign in there, that means that this whole chunk favors non-spontaneity. Or since I have a tendency to use value terms with these, favors implies that it's a positive thing. It's a favorable condition. We, when I say favorable condition, I mean favorable for spontaneity. When I say something's unfavorable, it means that it's not favorable for spontaneity. We might not want the reaction to happen. So I'm not using favorable and unfavorable that way. I'm saying favorable in terms of causing the reaction to happen. So with that in mind, delta S, S favors the reaction happening. Delta S does not. So is this reaction going to be spontaneous or not? What are your numbers? What are our numbers? And what's the temperature? That's a number. That's a number. <laughs> but this, this means that at, at high temperatures versus low temperatures, qualitatively, we even without knowing what delta H and delta S are, we can say, okay, at high temperatures, this reaction will happen. Or at low temperatures, this reaction will happen. So delta S favored non-spontaneity, right? When temperature gets big, this whole term gets bigger, right? So that's our unfavorable term. At high temperatures, our unfavorable term gets bigger. So does this reaction happen? Is this reaction gonna be spontaneous at high temperatures or low temperatures? Low temperatures. Low temperatures. So this is just like before with our meso compounds too, with our stereo centers, there's two binary options and two different variables for them, right? So there's always going to be this possibility that both of them favor spontaneity. There's a possibility that neither of them favor spontaneity. If both of them favor spontaneity, it'll be spontaneous at all temperatures. If neither of them favor spontaneity, it'll be, it will never be spontaneous at any temperature. And if one favors spontaneity and one doesn't, it'll be spontaneous at either high or low and non-spontaneous at the opposite, right? So those, those are your four possibilities for delta G. And that's, I believe on the, on the practice test, that's how it, it asks you, is this reaction gonna be favorable? Low temperatures, high temperatures, both or neither? Right, because those are the four options. Can delta H be written in terms of temperature? Delta H, we usually we make the assumption that delta H is a constant at all temperatures because the energy in the bonds doesn't really change much. It changes a little bit based on temperature because of the molecular vibrations. But for the most part, delta H is close to a constant within sig phase. But it is equal to uh, energy reading over something else. So you could have it in terms of temperature in there. It's in, in terms of kilojoules per mole. There's not a direct conversion for kilojoules per mole to a temperature. Oh, okay. Why not? <laughs> it's like MC delta T is Q. Right, so you could get Let me think of the best way to. Let me ponder that. Okay. Let's let that, let that question marinate because I don't. I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. I'm guess. just thinking more of having delta G in full terms of T so you can see exactly how it's working if you're changing the temperature. So we just make the assumption that delta H is not going to change. Right. So you can calculate delta H using computational chemistry as a function of temperature, but it's a very minuscule difference. For the most part, gotcha. uh, until you get to the temp to a temperature where 
the kinetic energy of the molecules. Um, of the kinetic energy of the atoms is so big that the bonds don't hold them together anymore. At which point you reach the plasma and you don't really have distinct molecules anyway. Sure. So <laughs> that's that's the extreme case. Gotcha. The exception. Right. All right, so I know we just said that there's some reactions that are never spontaneous at any temperature, but that's still not the whole story because every reaction we can get to happen a little bit, that's what equilibrium would tell us, right? Even if delta G does not favor spontaneity, we can still have the, make it a little bit of product. So how does that work? Because remember K, is equal to e to the minus delta g over rt. So r and t are both always positive. If delta g is negative, the reaction is spontaneous, right? Which would make this whole term positive, and you get e to a positive number. e to a positive number means you get a k that's greater than one, right? Yeah. If e is negative, or sorry, if, if delta G is positive, then this negative term means that the whole thing, you get K that's less than one, but you still get a non-zero K, which means even if it's a non-spontaneous reaction, you make some amount of product, right? And the reason for that is that we're talking about, when we're talking about delta G, we're talking about standard conditions, which means you're assuming that everything is at one mole per liter. So if you're starting with equal amounts of everything, equal concentrations of everything, it'll actually tell you which, which way the reaction will progress. If delta G for the reaction is positive, it's non-spontaneous, which means at equal, or if you start at standard conditions, it'll shift backward to make more reactant. And vice versa, if delta G is negative, and you start with everything at even concentrations, it's going to shift to make more product, right? So this isn't a separate way of viewing things compared to equilibrium. It's still equilibrium. We've just been talking about products and reactants at standard concentrations and where everything is equal. However, delta G is also not a constant. Not only do you have this delta H minus T delta S term in there, you can actually wind up with these numbers changing based on the concentrations. And so what winds up happening is that your delta G, not delta G, your Gibbs free energy, your G has this shape to it. It's going to have a potential energy minimum in there. And basically what happens if you start with only products are only reactants, I said that back, only reactants are only products, no matter which side you start from, you're going to wind up at the same energy minimum, the same equilibrium point. Right? And so the key here is that at delta G, we can think of delta G not as the difference between here and here. Delta G, now we're thinking about delta G in calculus terms. And what, what do you get when delta G is really, really small, when delta is really, really small? It's not really a full capital delta anymore, it's a derivative, which means delta G is the slope of this function. Where? Well, that means that it's always spontaneous until you hit here. It's either spontaneous forward, if you're looking at the slope here, it's gonna naturally move this way so towards equilibrium. So that's negative. If, delta, if you look at delta G here, that's positive. It's non-spontaneous but it's still going to progress. It's going to progress backwards. So in either case, whether you start with only products or only reactants or only products, either way, it's going to naturally progress until delta G is zero. 
at equilibrium. Because at equilibrium, when delta G is zero, is the reaction spontaneous or non-spontaneous if delta G is zero? No. Neither. So basically, you, if it's spontaneous forward, it's non-spontaneous backwards and vice versa. But regardless, it'll react until you get to delta G equals zero. So it's non -sp neither spontaneous nor non-spontaneous. Right? That's that special property of zero. It's not positive or negative, it's zero, right? It's not, which makes means it's not spontaneous or non-spontaneous. It's at equilibrium, which makes it a reversible process at that point. Once it reaches equilibrium, any change is reversible, which means delta S of the universe equals zero, because nothing is changing on the macro scale. All that is beyond what we need for this. This idea <laughs> of it's going to slide downhill until you get to the bottom, and that's what we call equilibrium, is the, is the key here. All right, so let's do a couple practice problems, and then we'll get into kinetics when we get back from our break. A little overcast. Let me turn the lights on. So this is one step removed from just is the, is the reaction spontaneous or not. If we know that some reaction will happen either way, does the reaction favor products versus reactants is just another way of looking at is delta G positive or negative, right? So if delta G is negative, it favors products or reactants? Products, products. If delta G is negative, it favors products. That's a spontaneous reaction. If delta G is positive, it favors reactants. So when we're given this delta G, can we look at it like that rate of change of the... Yeah, you can think of it that way. Yeah. So if delta G is greater than zero, then that means... Delta G is greater than zero, therefore K is greater than or less than one. Greater than one would favor. It would be a would favor, would favor yeah, products. So exactly. There's a lot of moving pieces. But they're all tied together in a one-to-one -to -one relationship. You just have to be able to think about it because these are all different ways. Like we can calculate delta G by looking at delta H formation, delta S formation values, right? It's like looking at a gear of a clock and trying to tell what time it is. It is a little bit. Like so, this means that, which means that, etc. Yeah. And the flip side is true as well, right? If delta G, all of these things, and actually I can put the double-sided bottom arrows. Yep. Anybody take a number theory? Done proofs more recently than geometry in high school? So if if you draw an arrow like this, it's an, that means therefore. If you draw it like that, that means if and only if, which means if the directionality or causality goes both ways. So, so if k is less than one, delta g is greater than zero. And if delta g is greater than zero, k is less than one. Both of those are true. It's it's a two-directional logic as opposed to if I just put front arrow, that means you could have K less than one without Delta G being greater than zero, which can't happen. So we can take some more comp sci classes or some more um, abstract math classes and start doing proofs again. You start seeing terminology like that again. So I'm just trying to be consistent with what you will see in the future. So if Delta G is less than zero, 
a is greater than one, favors product. What's the third case? If they are both equal to zero, or both equal to one. If delta G is equal to zero, K is equal to one, right. which means you're at equilibrium. So KQ is 0.5, that's less than one, which means the bottom half of our equilibrium definition is greater than the top half, which means it favors the reactants. So A and B both favor reactants. We're at 298 Kelvin. Delta H is plus 33 kilojoules per mole, and delta S is plus 150 joules per mole Kelvin. We've got to do the math. Because delta S favors spontaneity, but delta H favors non spontaneity. But those two numbers are bigger than that number no matter what, so it's always going to be negative, isn't it? Oh, no. God. <laughs> so delta G is equal to 3.3 times 10 to the 4 joules per mole minus 298. Kelvin times 150 joules per mole Kelvin. So this favors non-spontaneity, this favors spontaneity. So it's all a matter of just how it's 300 times 150. I believe that that's larger than 33 kilojoules. That's what I was thinking too. But you, it's close enough that I'd want to double check. This should give us something about 45 kilojoules, right? So that means delta G should be about negative 44 or 7. So about negative 11 kilojoules. I don't think I did that subtraction right, but it doesn't matter. All that matters is that sign. That sign is negative when we crunch the numbers, which means it's favors products. products. Here's the qualitative way of doing the same thing without doing numbers an exothermic reaction with a positive value for delta S. What is exothermic? So that's negative delta H is favors spontaneity. Positive value for delta S favors spontaneity. Does it matter what the temperature is? Spontaneous at all temperatures. Spontaneous at all temperatures, which means it favors products. The exact opposite case, endothermic reaction. So delta H favors non-spontaneity. And a negative value for delta S also favors non spontaneity. Doesn't matter the temperature, it's going to be non spontaneous, which means it favors reactants at all temperatures. So, and then if we look at the practice exam, we didn't get into these to the last few slides, right? right? We've got free energy, we've got a potential energy surface given. We're going to find some of these terms in the next. In the next part, but will this be will this reaction be spontaneous at this temperature? What is the um, 
if the overall reaction is exothermic and delta S in the reaction is less than zero, what effect would a decrease in temperature have on the following properties? There's a lot of moving pieces. You got to tell time by looking at the gear. <laughs> thing. It's a negative number, also negative. So if they're, it's exothermic, it's all positive. So it would go towards the reactants, okay? So delta S is less than zero. So delta S favors non-spontaneity. Right. So, and it would be minus a negative. So that would be positive. And you said it's exothermic, which is also positive. So that would be exothermic is negative. Oh, shit. Okay. Remember, because we're talking about from the point of view of the system. Mm -hmm. So if you decrease temperature, the unfavorable piece gets smaller, which means the overall reaction gets more favorable or more spontaneous. So the equilibrium constant should get larger. And we haven't talked about rate yet. We'll talk about rate in a second. And then these last two bits, we're going to talk about after break as well. Right. I guess let's finish talking about just a couple of, of key terms that we've, we've talked about a little bit, but I want to officially define them. Where if, if this reaction has these four steps, or rather three steps, where are the transition states? What's the definition of a transition state? Anybody remember? Top of the hill. Top of the hill. Maximums. I didn't know that would be a good definition for that. <laughs> Top of the hill. Top of the hill. So transition state, transition state, transition state. Where are the intermediates? <laughs> Bottom of the valley, do one and four count? No. No, because as it's drawn here, everything could be considered an intermediate between otherwise. But the way that this is defined, we're saying this is the start of our reaction. This is the end of our reaction. So our intermediates are two and three. So intermediates are only coming between the transition states. Between two transition states, yes. So uh, an intermediate, more, more mathematically, an intermediate is a potential energy minimum between your starting point and your ending point. It's what you change with the catalyst, right? Like those intermediate points? Sometimes. Sometimes a catalyst can, by definition, has to change the activation energy of one of the steps, which sometimes changes what the intermediate looks like. It can be the same intermediate with a lower barrier to get to that intermediate. So it's more the maximums. It's more the maximums, by definition. But that's an, an if and only if. A catalyst, by definition, changes activation energies, and it may change your intermediate energies or what your intermediates look like. Which step would have the largest equilibrium constant? I'm leaving off all the stuff about rates because we haven't done rates yet. The largest equilibrium constant The one that's most downhill in terms of delta G. It's the four. So, but it's that ending point. Right. So, we, but we got to talk about the step. Right. Because one to four is uphill in energy. Two to three is uphill in energy. Three to four is downhill in energy. So, three to four is the only step here that's actually spontaneous at this temperature. So three to four is going to have the largest equilibrium constant because it's the only one that's spontaneous. It's the only one where you favor products over reactants. And four to one, right? Four to one, if we were going, so typically when we're looking at these potential energy surfaces, we're assuming we're going one direction. 
from left to right. But yet you are correct. If we if we opened it up to going backwards, then three to two would have it would be exothermic or it would be exergonic is the term if you're talking about spontaneous. Three to two would be spontaneous, two to one would be spontaneous. The overall process from four to one would be spontaneous. But for the sake of answering these questions, assume that we're going through this in one direction. Keep walking off with the pendulum again. Is there one more piece to that question? Would the reaction be spontaneous at this temperature? We just talked about that, right? Delta G is positive at this temperature, which means it's non-spontaneous, which means K is less than one, which means it favors reactants. All of those mean the same thing, right? Okay, so we feel pretty good about equilibrium and, and delta G, or at least like we, everything we just said made sense. Something like that. <laughs> There's wood. Yeah. All right. So we'll talk about rates. Let's take our break and come back at five after. Um, and then we'll talk about rates and mechanisms. <laughs>
don't know if I have some feedback on this, it'll work. Just a purification, recrystallization. The synthesis of bromobutane was the last thing we did. Okay. And um, what did we do before that? Just dissolution. Uh, yeah, I don't easy shit so far. We. What are your guys' goals with getting all the knowledge? I'm just here for fun. Nice. Yeah, I'm doing mechanical engineering, so. Oh, cool. So you yeah, just figure your branch out a little bit. I like chemistry. Yeah, it's fun. John, so. Yeah. What about you, Zeke? I have no idea, really. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Fair enough. We'll see where I end up. <laughs> Working like a, any sort of direction as far as degree goes that you want? Or? Uh, biochemistry. Okay. Right? Yeah, nice. Uh, that opens a lot of doors. No real career goal with that, but I'm more into like boats and engines. And sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. Well, Tom was the right place for me. Yeah. I mean, I guess <laughs> everybody calls their mechanic nowadays, so everything just breaks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm more into like a sailboat where maintenance is like minimal. Yeah. yeah. Fuel is minimal. <laughs> right. right. I've gotten to sail a couple of times. One of my buddies out east had a sailboat. It was so much fun. Where out east? Um, it was uh, in New Jersey. I'm nice. trying to think of the marina. but um, It smelled like shit anyways out in Jersey. Oh, dude, for sure. It's on the of America. <laughs> it's the worst, like, summers there. It'd be like 100 degrees and 100% humidity. Don't even want to touch the water. You're just floating on it. <laughs> Yeah, I bought a sailboat out on the lake here when I was 19 and uh, taught myself how to sail, not a life jacket on board or a life okay. line. And uh, yeah, no roller furling or anything. So I was up there on the bow of the boat, ripping down my jib and tying oh, it up and shit. Oh, so like old school. Yeah, old school, way old school style, totally. <laughs> Shitty old fucking outboard that I found for like 600 bucks. Nice. Got it running and then just threw it on there. And oh, that's fun. It was cool. I got my, took, got to take my mom out for mom's Mother's Day, but. Yeah. Um, I had to sell it because I, I couldn't find a trailer, and uh, um, yeah. where I had it um, moored at, the owner was kind of over having the boat there, so <laughs> yeah, we'll get another one. It was a 78 Catalina. Okay. Yeah, oh, cool. it was a fucking really nice boat, 25 foot. Yeah. That's a good size test, but probably like getting up there as far as what you can do solo, huh? I mean, yeah, you could go up to like 35 solo, but depending on how many masts you have and kind of like jib setups you have, like out on the ocean, I wouldn't want to be doing that without a lifeline or a life jacket or anything. You know? <laughs> but I was moving at quite a pace, and if I fell off, I would, you know, I'd have to swim back to shore and catch up to the boat. Right. <laughs> so that same buddy who took me out, he would do uh, like every once in a while the California to Hawaii oh, yeah? sail. Nice. Like, yeah. So. On what boat? Um, I just He had like a 32 footer. I don't remember. What kind of boat it was, but Ooh. yeah, Ooh. It, it had all the bells and whistles. Nice. Yeah, I had no technology on that thing. It was just a sail. That's the best way to learn. A jib, and it had a fucking and swing keel. So nice. You know, <laughs> put down the keel, and you're good to go. And then if you wanted to beach the boat, you bring up the keel. Just, okay. Uh, like a Viking. <laughs> right. <laughs> jump off. The, yeah, jump off the bow and just hammer in with a moor line. <laughs> it's a fucking beach. That's awesome. That was a lot of fun. I got the nickname Sandbar Zeke because uh oh it's not a good nickname three times <laughs> in the same day. I was in the same day. Three times on the same day on the same boat. I it's the same sandbar. So <laughs> I was not navigation, I was just being told where to direct. Gotcha. And the same boat on the same sandbar oh, three times so one it day. <laughs> you just have to like what hop out and shove? Yeah, hop out and shove. It was like yeah. three feet deep. Oh, you okay. didn't have a swing keel on that boat. Oh, so okay. it was just a yeah. get out and uh, one time it was at night so we didn't want to get in the water so we just uh, but he had a stand-up paddleboard blow up once we blew that up and then oh. threw out an anchor about 20 feet away from the boat and just started pulling oh, the anchor up. just away from the sandbar yeah. and yeah, started up the engine. But yeah, that was a lot of fun. I mean, <laughs> right, you're just getting stuck. That's like the whole uh, mo of uh, off roading, right? It's like go fuck around till you get stuck and then figure out how to unstuck. I love off roading, so yeah. yeah. Oh, there's a good spot for that too. That's a good spot right there. Yeah, I mean the Rubicon's not as gnarly as I'd like. I go out in like off the off road trails. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I got a T100 Toyota. Oh, dude, badass. Engineered in Japan, so. Yeah, back no shit. Yeah, no American bullshit involved. <laughs> what kind of car are you at? 
Uh, Tacoma. Nice. Which is great. I'm modded. What year? Really little. A 17? 2017. So, yeah, I worked as a paramedic and worked a shit ton of overtime and just wanted like a reliable vehicle. So I did a ton of research and I found it in pain. Nice. So the only complaint I heard about that year was that it uh, uh, transmission sucks. Every automatic <laughs> transmission sucks pretty much. Yeah, I mean, I can't find that an automatic transmission doesn't lag from first to second. No, yeah. right? they all do. They, they all do that. And yeah. uh, but I mean, anything past that, so it doesn't seem to make a difference. <laughs> At that point, it's like such a small change in gear ratio. Yeah, but at the same time, I'm constantly from first to second when I'm, when I'm off roading. So right. Yeah, yeah that's that's, that's really like to go to four low or anything because I'm not doing anything crazy. But yeah. Have you heard of four wheel drive action? They used to be four wheel drive 24 7. No, no, no. Out in Australia. Uh, they just drive their uh, Hiluxes. Well, they used to be known as Hiluxes, but yeah. they're 79 series uh, Toyota pickups oh, that have yeah. inline six cylinder diesels that are illegal here in, Cal in America. Right. So they just have you know better engineering for the cars because their roads are shittier. We have better roads, but our cars are shittier. <laughs> you can you can thank the Germans for that one. Ew. You know, I really wanted to get like a diesel, but I was looking into it and pretty much like it looks like legislation was made so that like only American companies are allowed to sell diesels to try to just like you know if you if you can bypass your ETR and put in new lifters for the new newer Cummins, then you're good to go with any Cummins. Oh. <laughs> Those are the two problems with the newer ones because yeah. the lifters are just better engineered and then the EGR is supposed to be good better for the environment, right. it's worse for your engine, right. and it ends up burning more fuel at the end of the day. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, we're looking at, at getting a new, my wife and I both drive cars that are approaching 20 years old at this point and are not super well maintained. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at getting an EV. When you look at the numbers, hey, you look at the number, you can spend like 900 bucks on electricity and go 40,000 miles, as opposed to the 16,000 in gas it might cost you for the same. Yeah, it's uh, you got to think about the global cost though. There's slaves that are making it easy for that. So there are those are all involved. <laughs> right? There's that argument holds true both for cars and for EVs. And the, the pit mines at least have you have the environmental effects more contained mm -hmm. as opposed to being global. And CO2 is a bigger problem than most of those, those solid that solid and liquid waste that gets produced in the mines and making the batteries. Um, plus it's way cheaper to use electric, electricity is getting cheaper and cheaper. You're going to Prius then or what? You're going to be trying to We need something that can hold, that can hold five people and a dog on a road trip. So we're like, we got a Kia makes a three row SUV full electric that's under $40,000. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to beat that yeah. just from a practicality standpoint. So that's probably where, where we're going to go next. Yeah, talk about durability as well. Any mechanic will say a Kia is not going to make it to 100,000 miles. So. It's true. Well, but I don't know if that applies to their electric vehicles. Exactly. We haven't seen them. We haven't seen them yet. So, yeah. luckily, both of our cars are still drivable at this point. You got Toyotas, right? So. A Toyota and a Chevy. Oh, my wife's driving a 2003 Chevy Trailblazer. That, oh. that thing is. Piece of work. Yeah. Yeah. At least you can wrench on it though. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think you got that's <laughs> All right, let's let's do some chemistry. Let's talk about rates again. This should also be mostly review from Gen Chem. Then we're going to get into applying it to OCHEM. Um, in general, when we're talking about kinetics, so what we've been talking about in the past with equilibrium and delta G values for the overall reaction and intermediates is all considered thermodynamics. So equilibrium equals thermodynamics. Kinetics means rates. Kinetics means how quickly does something happen. And so there is some interplay between the two um, because really you reach equilibrium when your forward reaction and your reverse reaction are, are equal. Because if you have your forward reaction and your reverse reaction at happening at the same overall rate, there's zero net change. Right, so that's part of our definition of dynamic equilibrium was that, yeah, stuff's still happening, things are still moving around, but there's no measurable change in concentrations. So is this just looking 
at pretty much the concentration of products. Reactants. Well, K, if I is that, is that products of reactants in this case, or is that no? So lowercase k okay. is equal is the rate constant, and so the rate constant is is um it's a constant like it says that's related to how quickly do you reach equilibrium, not where is the equilibrium. Is there a way to calculate lowercase k, or is that experimental? No, there is so it's it's experimentally found by just you can do you remember doing the the um, method of initial rates experiment back in Gen Chem where you you said okay after ten seconds we measure the concentration or we're going to measure how long it takes for a concentration to change this much and you get a change in concentration over change in time because that's our other definition here is rate. Equal to our change in concentration of, of a product. Remember, brackets means uh, molarity over change in time. Um, so you can measure that and then work backwards. What was my initial concentration of reactants to figure out what K is? But you can also do it theoretically. So remember, my cursive means lowercase k when I'm writing on the board in my handwriting. Um, otherwise, just be very explicit with the way that you're writing things, whether it's capital K or lowercase k. Mm -hmm. It has a similar form, the equilibrium concept, but instead of delta G, it's negative activation energy over RT. So similar ideas, except that we're Activation energy, by definition, is always going to be positive. Which means this number is always going to be greater than one. Is that right? No, it's always going to be greater than zero. It'll always be negative, right? It'll always be greater than zero. This number will always be negative because of the negative signs. All of these are always positive. And an X, a negative exponent means it will always be less than one. Yeah. Oh yeah, the zero is one. No so matter what, it'll always be. Oh, one. that's why. What I'm missing. There's also another constant in front of there. I'm like, it can't be true because that k is greater than one all the time. So this could be seen as a whatever constant that is over e to the activation energy of RT, looking at as a fraction to get rid of that negative. Yeah, you could you could do that. Uh, uh yeah two fractions it's not easy to see <laughs> well and the other thing is this is a, such a common form that it's it's really it's usually just left like this but the, the main point here is that temperature is going to affect our rate constant when temperature goes up so if e is always going to be less than one or this term is always going to be less than one Right? When temperature goes up, this whole term gets less negative because the number gets smaller, which means this whole term gets bigger, gets closer to one. As temperature goes up, this number gets bigger, which means your rate gets faster. So rate will always increase as temperature increases. And it doesn't, but it doesn't increase linearly because we have this really complex function, not complex mathematically, no imaginary numbers here. Um, this complicated function is not an easy function to look like. And if you, if you have that one over, and then you also have the denominator being affected in an exponent. So it's just right. problematic. It's, it's hard to visualize, but the, the bullet point is the temperature increases, rate increases, period. It might increase a lot. It might increase a little bit because the function, if you look at K as a function of temperature, you get something that looks like this or looks like exponential growth, but then it sort of like plateaus out. 
And so for this region, you have this exponential relationship between temperature and T. And then as temperature gets larger past that a certain point, it becomes concave down and it's no longer exponential growth, but it's still increasing. So again, very few times will I actually give you an absolute, but here's one of them. Temperature goes up, rate goes up. The rate constant, one last question about this. The yeah. rate constant is unique to each reaction happening, correct? So correct. That, that's where it's coming from. Right. And A factors in, you can think of activation energy as like the enthalpy piece. Yeah. A has all of the entropy, the likelihood of the probability of, of these molecules running into each other with the correct orientation. Is that the Arrhenius constant? That's the, they call it the pre-Arrhenius constant. Because this is the Arrhenius equation. Mm -hmm. This term is the Arrhenius term. That's the pre-Arrhenius term. Gotcha. I believe. I might be mixing that up, but I think that that's right. All right. So what is that? What happens if we get something that's a little bit more complicated? If it's not as simple as just one molecule going through a process. So if it's a nuclear reaction, then, or a first order reaction, then you just have this this term that looks like that, where the amount of A that you start with and, the, and K are the only two things that affect the rate. You increase A, you increase your rate. You can have more complicated rate constants that usually that's based on, okay, if, if your reaction is based on two molecules have to run into each other in order for a reaction to happen, then the probability that that happens is partially based on those two molecules and their concentrations. You've got more cars on the road, you're gonna have more accidents. Can't have any reaction if there's no cars on the road. And so the, that makes the equation look more complicated, but at the same time, K is still the same. That, that pre radius factor, that A, is gonna be dependent on on the, the specifics of the geometries and orientations and things like that. But K itself doesn't really, isn't really affected by concentrations. So just to review these terms, if it's, if we can say that rate, that rate is equal to K times a con one single concentration, then we call that first order. Basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna sum up the exponents out of all of the reactants that show up in the rate law. And that's our overall reaction order. So for the second one, this is an overall second order reaction, where we'd say it's first order in A and first order in B. You double your concentration of A, your rate doubles. You double your concentration of B, your rate doubles. You double your concentration of both of them and your rate quadruples. It doubles and doubles again. So this is saying, for second order, for example, you have two reactants that are giving you the same solution reacting together, and that is where this exponent comes from. Exactly. So for third order, you have you need two molecules, one and one of the other, to make it actually go to the other side. Is that correct? If it was a single step reaction, you'd be right. Okay. In these multi-step reactions, if you're if your rate determining step, if your slowest step, which usually corresponds to with whatever has the highest activation energy. If whatever has the highest activation energy is based on an intermediate running into something else, you get one of these third order reactions. Very rarely is it actually three things have to hit each other at once. It's more like I get a three car pileup. You never actually have three cars hitting each other at the same time, right? Car one hits car two and then car three comes in later. The odds of a three car pileup therefore are based on how often does a two car pileup happen? And then how often does a third car hit it? That's really two different things happening, right? So this could be seen as the concentration of A times concentration of B times concentration of C, right? As far as reactants. Right. Or even A has to run into A 
And then when A runs into A, it makes an intermediate, and that intermediate has to run into B. Gotcha. And A would just be first step reactants, and B is second step reactants. But take, yeah, but take, but that doesn't show up in your overall balance reaction, right? right? Your overall balance reaction doesn't take into account intermediates or anything like that. So even though we never actually have a three car pileup go straight from zero to three car pileup, it can look like that in our rate law. Because in order to do, we wind up having to do some substitutions. So if if we have something that looks like this, if this is A plus B, if the overall reaction is 2A plus B goes to goes to C. Let me redraw that after that. If A plus B have to run into each other to make some AB intermediate, and then AB has to run into another A. Well, what's your concentration of AB at any given time? Your concentration of AB is based on your initial concentrations here. So rate one, the rate for this first step is going to be K1 times concentration of A times concentration of B. If we say that rate one is your change in concentration of AB over a change in time, we can wind up doing some differential equations to solve for concentration of AB. And then you have to substitute that in because your actual rate determining step is AB plus A goes to the final step. So you wind up having to do a bunch of algebra and substitutions because you can't just put that in there because we don't have a way of measuring concentration of AB because it's an intermediate. We have a system of differential equations. We have a system of differential equations. But there are simple functions we can separate and integrate and actually get a term for, it for concentration of AB in terms of K1 and these initial concentrations. So, and there's a couple of assumptions you can make. You can assume that, that this first step, because it's so much faster, is at equilibrium. So you can assume that this is zero, because you, if you're at equilibrium, and then if you do that, then you can wind up separating these terms out a lot easier, getting a, just doing an algebraic system equation. You don't actually, do the differential equations if you assume that these two are at equilibrium. But you do wind up with a complicated term with your overall rate constant is based on K1 and K minus one, which is the reverse reaction and your initial concentrations. And then when you do your substitution, simplify it all out, it gets really nasty, right? So could you just apply statistics to it? Then you basically are by assuming it's at equilibrium, you're making the assumption that because it's that step is so much faster than the other step, um, that you are using law of large numbers already by so doing that. The probability of A and B times the probability of A, B, and A would be rate overall for rate one, two, right? It gets more complicated than that, but you're on the right track. You're thinking about it the right way. Okay, right. The other, basically, you're going to make that assumption that that these two steps, the forward K one and K minus one, are at equilibrium. Mm -hmm. You actually can't just say that's equal to zero. You have to see this is equal to K minus one times concentration of AB is equal to K one times concentration of A concentration of B. That's where it gives us our concentration of AB we can solve for, but we're going to wind up having to, and I think there's a negative term in there too. Yeah. Well, because one's forward reaction, one's backward reaction. But either way, that's beside the point. That's all just to explain how third order reactions can happen because you have to have first step, then the second step. 
And that all boils down to you can have a combined K that is a combination of K2, K1, and K minus one. Um, that derivation, when you start getting into enzymes, enzyme kinetics are a special kind of hell. Um, mm -hmm. They have their own kinetics because you've got a catalyst that can be occupied, taken up, but doesn't get used up. So it's not a true reactant. So you actually have an equilibrium constant mixed in with all of these different rate constants, mixed in with your concentrations. And your concentration of enzyme is not the same as your concentration of available enzyme um, and it winds up getting even nastier. But that's upper division stuff for the most part. I learned systems of differential equations. There's like a really interesting question about chemistry actually. It was we were just like learning about springs, mm -hmm. like boxes and springs. So when you have multiple boxes connected to multiple springs, like the way they move together you can use differential equations to describe it. But one of the questions was like, imagine you have an infinite number of boxes and it said like, that's a good way to describe how certain particles actually work. Any solid, basically, you can describe some infinite number of particles connected with an infinite number of springs. Um, well, didn't we say last class that there's only one electron in the universe? Right, yeah, so the one, one electron just universe, just separate. Separate. and actually, <laughs> That actually showed up on my Google feed. So I don't remember what I was reading about, but they, that actually showed up because they were talking about how positrons, um, which is an electron with a positive charge, could be explained by the, uh, the one electron in the universe traveling back in time. If you're going reverse, going backwards in time, it flips the charge on the electron, and that's how the electron can be in everywhere at the same time. This is traveling forward in time and backward in time simultaneously. Yeah, anyway. Doesn't that go against like Occam's razor? And then it's like, go it, it says Occam's razor gets misinterpreted though. It doesn't mean the simplest explanation is likely true. It means the, the explanation that requires the fewest assumption, assumptions and fits the data. And the math is complicated enough that having one electron that can travel back in time actually might be the simplest way of explaining it mathematically. Um, in terms of talking about how different electrons interfere with each other and themselves simultaneously, it starts looking a little bit more plausible. But yes, well, the likeliest explanation that we have thus far, and we're not right. doing very well. And that still says that. likeliest. <laughs> That's the other thing about Occam Fraser. It's not a smoking gun. Yeah. It just means this is probably the best option. There's like ten qualifiers in Occam. Right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about activation energy a little bit. Uh, so we got to the, the most important one here is, is temperature, because activation energy doesn't really change other than introducing a catalyst. The way we can think about this is if we have some distinct one-step reaction that has a certain activation energy, only a certain proportion of molecules have enough energy to make it over that barrier. And so the probability that a molecule can make it over that barrier is based on two things. How high is the barrier and how fast are the molecules moving on average? So that's those are your two keys for K. If activation energy goes up, reaction slows down because a smaller proportion of the molecules can make it above that barrier. So do you guys remember this graph, Boltzmann's distribution? This is basically how many molecules have um, a certain amount of kinetic energy at a given temperature. If you change the temperature, you change the shape of this graph. It's the same shape, but flattened out or steeper. Low temperatures, this graph gets a lot sharper. And so at low temperatures, a smaller fraction of the molecules can are have enough energy to make it past that barrier. And because you can think of, when I say the fraction of molecules, that's basically the integral that's past this, this number. If you change your activation energy, that obviously is gonna change the fraction of molecules that have enough energy, right? If I drop the activation energy by even just a little bit, a whole lot more molecules can do that. 
if I increase the temperature, it flattens this out. It still has the same general shape, but now 40% of the molecules can make it over that barrier instead of 10% of the molecules or 2% of the molecules. This is called a Bolton curve. Since this little... this distribution, it's not a bell curve. It looks like a bell curve. It's a distinct curve, though, because a bell curve is symmetrical usually, and at the very least, it goes infinitely in both directions. Right? You can't go infinitely in both directions here because you can't have a molecule with negative energy. Even if you could get down to absolute zero, that would still only take it to zero energy. It still doesn't give it negative energy. It would never be zero molecules because it's really something. Yeah. <laughs> so this shape, this bell curve-ish thing that goes off to infinity in the positive direction but stops at zero here is a Boltzmann distribution, just like so it's similar to a Gaussian distribution. And this that's where actually what these equations that have this e to the minus activation energy over rt term comes from is from the Boltzmann distribution. Right, and so as I, like I was drawing before, the lower temperature, you're going to have a smaller number of molecules that are past that threshold. Higher temperature, the curve flattens out, still doesn't go negative, flattens out, and now you can, might have, instead of 5% of the molecules can make it past that threshold, 20% of the molecules can make it past that threshold, which is going to dramatically increase your rate if it's 1 in 5 versus 1 in 20. Catalysts also change that because catalysts change where that cutoff is. Basically, you can think of catalysts as, as changing the activation energy. It can be more complicated than that. It can take what's, what would naturally be a one-step reaction and make it several steps. It can change the energy of intermediates if there are already intermediates. There's a, basically catalysis covers a whole host of possibilities, but what they all have in common is, your, is the activation energy for your slowest step drops. And it can actually change what your slowest step is. So it can actually change the rate law entirely because the, remember our rate law was based on which step in our process has the largest activation energy. So if your if your catalyst drops the activation energy for step one far enough, it can actually make it so that step two is your rate determining step now. Which means, and that's going to totally change whether it's first order, second order, third order. Okay, so catalysis is a whole different bag of worms. Enzymes are a part of that, right? Enzymes are one version of that. Enzymes are the version that show up in biochemistry, but there's a lot of catalysis that's not biological. Um, what is a catalytic converter work? Exactly. A catalytic converter is just a solid surface. It turns out that a lot of, of metal surfaces, metal surfaces can catalyze a lot of organic reactions by giving, by giving these molecules a place to adhere, and that can weaken certain bonds. And by weakening those bonds, other molecules can come in and then react with it better. So all a catalytic converter is, is a whole bunch of space of, of surface area made out of these rare earth metals that catalyze certain reactions really well. It's platinum, palladium, and rhodium, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, you have like half order reactions, what does that mean? Half order reactions mostly show up in biochemistry because you get those enzymes being used up and it can happen in when with catalysis in general, um, basically, if you have more reactant, then you have space for the reactant to adhere. <laughs> then it's not a true first order reaction because it's based on how much surface area you have or how many, how much enzyme you have. So half order reactions basically are just a more complicated potential energy surface where you wind up with your 
catalyst itself affecting the rate, even though it's not part of the balance reaction. Which again, whole nother can of worms. And we'll talk about how some of that works going forward. Is there less volume than the react than the enzymes, or it it can change from time to time. It depends. And so ask about that during the review session. Because the key that I want to get to um, is we'll talk about that in another state. Um, we talked about defining transition states versus intermediates. This is just more slides on that. The transition states are your potential energy maximums, local maximums, and your intermediates are potential energy minimums in between your starting point and your ending point, which is somewhat arbitrary, like we talked about. A couple more vocab terms that we we'll use to talk about these mechanism steps are, so most of the reactions we're gonna deal with in organic chemistry are polar reactions, meaning that um, charge drives them. We're not dealing with any nuclear reactions, um, other than a few in, a, in a, a few free radical reactions we'll talk about, most of our reactions are going to be driven by partial positives and partial negatives or positives and negatives. We're basically just looking at Coulombic forces. All right, so that we kind of de define everything in terms of these partial charges. So we can say things like the carbon atom is electron deficient. I don't really like that terminology. I would just usually say it's got a partial positive. Um, or you can have an electron rich area, but basically it's all based on electronegativity and where these, these electrons are likely to found, be found. Partial positives are attracted to partial negatives like you would expect. And that's gonna be the driving force in most of our reactions. Bill valences, partial positives are attracted to partial negatives. Right. And so the other terminology that gets used is nucleophiles and electrophiles. A nucleophile is anything that has lots of electrons. It is attracted to a nucleus, a partial positive. We say nucleophile instead of a, I don't know, a positiveophile, hydrophile, with hydrophile or something, because all nuclei have a positive charge. Right, so electrophiles are attracted to nucle or sorry, electrophiles are attracted to electrons, nucleophiles are attracted to positive charges, aka nuclei. So out of these, ethoxide versus ethanol, which would be a stronger nucleophile? Which one's gonna be more attracted to a partial positive? Ethoxide. Yeah, it's as simple as larger charge is greater attraction. I want to play the devil's advocate and say something about the polarity of bonds, but what? <laughs> Except sure. that a full negative charge is even more yeah. um, strongly attracted. It, and really, it, it can come back to the force of attraction between charges is equal to, I'm not going to use the right. Based something like that, the charge A times charge B over the, the, the distance squared, something like that, right? In the physics, it's like K times the K1 times K2 or something, right? So, same basic idea it's the charges, and if you double the charge on one of them, you double the attraction. So, a full negative one is going to be a lot stronger than a, a partial charge. I've never seen. So. That and that's fair. So, but that's that's the relationship. It's the charge, charge one times charge two over the distance squared. Sorry. All right. So this is just defining electrophiles. What I want to spend more of our time on is these mechanism steps, because this is a last problem or last two problems on the practice test is basically classifying these steps. And so all these mechanism steps 
are going to give us is basically we're just showing electron movement. Anytime you've got a before and after, whether it's a one-step reaction or going to intermediates, all of your electron movement is usually going to follow one of these four steps or some combination of these four possibilities. You can have a nucleophilic attack, which is where something with a partial negative or with a lone pair attacks something with a partial positive. You can have a group that just leaves and takes the electrons with it. Usually your leaving group leaving, we, we define your leaving group as whatever is going to, because we define everything in terms of the electrons moving, your leaving group is almost always going to bring the electrons with it when it leaves. So if you have a sigma bond breaking, a lot of times it looks like leaving group leaves. Would it be like the auto-ionization of water? That's a proton transfer. That's the next one. The proton transfer is a specific case of a leaving group leaving. Gotcha. And then you can have rearrangement, which is a little bit more niche. Most of them are going to fall in these first three categories. Nucleophile attacks. So, and we're always talking about from the point of view of the electrons moving. So here's an example of a nucleophilic attack. You've got something with a bunch of electrons with a negative charge. You have something with a positive charge or a partial positive charge. Those electrons pair of those electrons can come in here and attack there and form a new covalent bond. Right? And so the key with drawing these arrows is if we're showing electrons moving, one, we always, the arrows are always showing the electrons moving. So you're always starting your arrow from a pair of electrons and it has to be a curved arrow. A curved arrow specifically in chemistry means we're showing electron movement. So it's not a reaction arrow, it's what's happening over the course of the reaction, right? Sometimes you have to have two arrows on a nucleophilic attack because we can't have 10 electrons around a carbon. So if you've got a nucleophile, something with a lone pair and something with a partial positive, these this lone pair, this partial negative is going to be attracted to the partial positive, but you need to make room for it. So sometimes that means you have to draw another arrow moving a pair of electrons. And so this is getting into um, sometimes you can combine these step, steps to have like leaving group leaves at the same time as the nucleophile attacks. This would not be leaving group leaves because we still have all of our sigma bonds are still in place. Leaving groups leaving is the exact opposite of a nucleophile attacking. So nucleophile attacking is going to make a new sigma bond. Leaving group leaves is going to remove a sigma bond. You take a sigma bond and you give those electrons to whichever atom um, is more electronegative. The electrons that are part of the sigma bond have to stay with one of these two nuclei. So they're going to stick with the nuclei that's more electronegative. So bromine's leaving and it's taking its toys with it. And so, and the, this, you'll notice this is literally the exact opposite of the first example on the last slide. On the last slide, we started with bromine, with the bromide and the carbocation. The bromide came in here and attached to the carbocation. Proton transfer, we're always thinking about it like Bronsted Lowry. So we've seen this before, where this is just showing the individual electrons moving, or individual electron pairs. Very, we're not really going to split up electrons into individual electrons at this point, we're still dealing with pairs moving around. And so if we have hydronium and we have an oxygen with a lone pair, it's always going to be a lone pair grabs an H plus 
and then those electrons have to go somewhere. Hydrogen can't have more than two electrons, so if we're making a new bond with hydrogen, whatever whatever um, atom that hydrogen was attached to is going to keep those electrons. Right, just like we had to make room for our new bond with the with the um, I bond moving, we have to make room for our new sigma bond here by breaking the previous sigma bond if it's a proton. What's the other product here? What are we left with? We start with acetone and hydronium. We get this compound plus water. water. Right? So all that we're really showing with these mechanisms is the actual bonds forming and breaking. And I'm not going to throw you right into the deep end with this practice test and say, draw the mechanism. I'm going to say, here is a bunch of steps in a reaction. Draw the arrows that get from A, a to the first intermediate, from the first intermediate to the second intermediate. And that's going to be the hardest thing on this test because it's one we have the least experience with it. And it's honestly, it's one of the trickier concepts. We're going to keep working with mechanisms moving forward. Um, but just because it seems like this is a big thing to throw at you, you 10 of the points involved here are just identify which of those four choices. This is basically multiple choice. It's going to be all of these steps, all of these arrows are going to be one of those four types of steps that we we were talking about. And so here we've got a lone pair attacking a partial positive. That's going to be a nucleophile attack. Here we have several things happening. We have a pair of electrons coming down, but then chlorine is leaving and taking its electrons with it. So that's leaving group leaves. Then here we have another lone pair, except that this time the lone pair is grabbing in a hydrogen instead of making a new sigma bond with the carbon. So proton, proton transfer. All right, so you look at what you start with and what you end with, what's the net result and where are the electrons moving? It's always going to be one of those four choices. We, got a break. we, didn't, we didn't do rearrangement yet. I said four. So basically, rearrangement is if you have an intermediate that's that can be made more stable by just shifting a bond over one spot. So, for instance, if we have a carbo a uh, carbocation, so that's got an empty p orbital here shown here, right? This carbon here can donate some electron density. This carbon hydrogen bond can give some electron density over there to kind of stabilize it a little bit. If, if it can shift the entire bond over, if it's going to make it more stable. So who, does anybody remember our rules for stability for carbocations? It's been a it's been a little bit since we talked about those. So Primary, ter secondary, tertiary. Which of these is going to be mo most stable? Primary, secondary, tertiary. 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 Because a tertiary carbocation has another CH3 or another CH3 over here, right? Which means that in three different directions, you can have some of this donating electron density, right? If you can shift a hydrogen from one carbon to the next carbon next door to get a more stable carbocation, it goes through a rearrangement. So basically, and what the mechanism looks like for that, so here we have a secondary carbocation, positive charge on a secondary carbon, but it's next to a tertiary carbon. If it's next to a tertiary carbon, you can wind up with these electrons that are part of this bond here basically jumping over and filling the secondary carbon and then but then that leaves a gap on the tertiary carbon so we still have a carbocation but it's a more stable carbocation right so that one takes a little bit to see so that's like resonance but opposite 
Yeah, you can think it's similar to the residence if by moving the electric. The reason it's that it's not residence is because we're actually moving a sigma bond. Our number one rule for resonance is no, don't move the sigma bonds. Right? This is just a special case. If it's a rearrangement, you can have basically you can sh it's called a hydride shift. If there's a hydrogen that you can move over one spot to give yourself a better carbocation, a more stable carbocation, then it'll do that. That's not something that I'm going to expect you to be able to see at this point yet. So that specifically won't show up on the test. And in fact, I'm kind of thinking of maybe, uh, maybe not doing 10. Maybe I'll do some other, I might do a wild card for 10. Would you rather have a wild card question for 10 or try and draw the arrows for 10? Both. Both? <laughs> rather know what, to know what to expect. Yeah. Okay. You know me, I like I like my test to be out of 100 points, so I don't want to just ax it entirely. We'll see how the review goes, I guess, with this. Um, and we'll go through some examples here. But the key with this, if the arrows aren't drawn for you, is to look at here A and B and see what's different. So for A and B, the big thing that's different is we added an H plus here, right? So if the only thing that's different about this molecule is we add an H plus to it, what type of, of step does it have to be? Proton transfer. So if you know what those four options are, even if I don't draw the arrows for you, drawing the arrows is still tricky. And, and like I'm saying, I'm expecting this is gonna be the part that you struggle the most, but this is the stretch question on the test. I know it's gonna be hard, and you're not going to do it perfectly. That's okay. I give lots of partial credit. Give it, if you can at least just say, I don't know how to draw the arrows, but I recognize this is proton transfer. That's, if you did that for all of these steps, that's probably a seven out of 10. Right? If you can just identify what the step is without even trying to draw an arrow. If you can get to the point where you can draw the arrows, that would be a, you know, now we're like, okay, this is someone who's looking to get 100 out of 100 on this test, which I don't expect anybody to do, right? So don't focus on this part because I know it's the hardest. This though, I think is more reasonable. If you have those examples, I give you the arrows and just say, what happened? Which of these four options is it? This one will take some time but I also expect that I think that that everybody should be able to do pretty well on this one because it's it's very conceptual and it's concepts we've spent a lot of time with. I know we only officially covered it today, but we've been talking about these ideas, equilibrium and delta G for a month now. And then a lot of it's nomenclature, a lot of it's sort of vocab. I, it's not true vocab, like what's the definition of meso, but it's like, oh, it's applying vocab concepts, right? Um, you'll have a full two hours on Thursday to work on it. And you know what's, what's coming. There's going to be, like for six, the only thing that's going to be different is it's not going to be this exact compound. It might be tri-substituted, might be di-substituted, it might be cis, might be trans, but it's going to be a cyclohexane with some stuff on it. Draw me the most stable compound. Seven or five is going to be Newman projection. I'm just going to change what the molecule is and maybe, um, actually I'm not even going to change these other than it might be C1 to C2 instead of C, instead of C2 to C3, depending on what the molecule is but there's going to be a Newman projection. That's one I think that everybody can get 10 out of 10 on. I think we're pretty good at once you review. That's <laughs> <laughs> so a small enough group that I'm hopeful that I'm going to finally get to, actually, an OCHEM, I, I, finally, I do get to get to the point where I give a 10 out of 10 on the question for the entire class. 
um, on occasion on some of these questions. In gen chem, that never happens. Mm -hmm. Even if it's simple as counting protons, neutrons, and electrons on, a, on an atom, somebody is going to mistake and, and get, get the wrong answer somewhere. I'll give not 10 out of 10 for 29 out of 30 students, but somebody always misses it. Uh, but there's a lot of, of easy points based on the stuff we've spent time on. Nomenclature is going to be a struggle. Nomenclature is like the sig figs of OCHEM. You're always, there's always something that you did just a little bit wrong in the nomenclature. It's just going to keep coming back. We're going to keep getting better at it, but it's an easy place to mess up. For the first nomenclature question, should we worry about cis and trans? For these ones? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Or R versus S. You don't have to specify cis and trans if you do the R and the S properly. But that's not specifically what I'm testing here. I want you paying attention to that. Actually, this is a meso compound. Um, so it actually doesn't have cis or trans. Um, or so just cis or trans is all you need, rather. Right. And then this one, if I if you recognize that there's a stereo center in there, but I don't give you enough information to say if it's R or S, then you know, plus one point for catching a typo on my part. If you say this should have a stereo isomer, but I don't know which one it is, but just name it without the R and the S if I don't give you the information. Uh, resonance structures, those are tricky. Molecular formula though, and, and recognizing SP2s and SP3s. I feel like everybody has a pretty good handle on this. So don't, don't suffer from the recency bias of the last thing we, we covered feels the hardest because you've spent the less, least time with it. 90%, at least 80% of the test should feel like you understand the concepts relatively well, even if there's lots of, of potential places to miss a point here or a point there. Um, just because I know that, that last one's gonna be tricky, All right? Questions before we break for, for a bit. Okay. Then um, I don't have anything in particular to cover because we I know, but I'm happy to go over those mechanism steps again in lab, go over other parts of the practice test. Uh, is the key available for the practice test yet? Okay, so I'll post that key in the next hour as well, so you can check your answers to it, um, and then we can go over any issues that you have, anything you want more practice with. Gary, sometimes I put the key is in the assignment, so I wasn't sure if this is one of those ones. I know I haven't made the announcement. I looked in the, I looked in the pages, too, and I didn't, I didn't 